Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Nightlight, a reminder that you are never alone. everybody and welcome to Nightlight. Thanks for joining us and spending some of your evening with us. We really appreciate your viewership, your listenership and, and archiveship. And we really appreciate the fact that you do take the time to listen to the shows and give us comments and suggestions and encouragement. First of all, though, I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for that amazing introduction. He and his wife have a website called nativestorytellers.com. I I highly recommend you visit it, check out the website, and learn a different way of preserving history and uh, learn a little bit about our past in, in a very unusual and unique way. Mark has a great show in store for you tonight. He has two amazing guests. And we're very excited that that we were able to get them together in spite of the weather that is pummeling on on at least two of us, if not all four. So welcome to the show, Mark, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that nothing touches down too close to anyone. Uh, Yeah, uh, it's at the point, uh, if you you can cross some toes, too, that would be helpful. Just try to make it the next couple hours. But uh, hey, hey how, how's everything with you? Everything's going well so far. Okay. Well, ho- yeah, ho- hopefully Jeff isn't going to make an appearance and <laughs> cause any problems for us tonight. Uh, Knock a gun, yeah, wood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We and uh, you know, my, you know, we have a lot of information to uh, cover tonight, so I might as well just get uh, cut cut out the rants about tornado warnings in the area and um, maximize our time with our uh, terrific guests. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, the earthen mounds in the Ohio Valley, um, but, but we haven't really gone into <clears throat> a, a lot of uh, detail about stone structures along the whole East Coast, and our two guests tonight are going to change that. Uh, we have joining us tonight uh, two researchers who have been intensely studying uh, Native American structures in New England. Uh, Dr. Curtis Hoffman recently published Stone Prayers, uh, Native American Stone Constructions of the Eastern Seaboard, and he's a professor of anthropology at Massachusetts Bridgewater State University. Uh, Steve DeMarzo is an avocational archaeologist with affiliations with NERA and was a contributor to Stone Prayers as well. And so are you, Barbara. <laughs> that's right. So, that's right. Long, long time yeah. ago, but I was there. Yeah. 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 So, so hi, Dr. Hoffman. Hi, Steve. Hi, yeah. Hi, hi. yeah, glad, glad you're with us tonight. So, um, you know, you know, Dr. Hoffman, you have what, uh, 
over 5,000 sites you have uh, let's say uh, compressed into stone prayers Uh, a lot of people are very interested in discovering maybe rediscovering might be a better term Mm -hmm. uh, America's prehistory and the uh, native cultures. Um, you know, oh, oh, what was your vision for writing Stone Prayers? Well, back in around 2004, I was invited to a meeting that took place up in the town of Carlisle, Massachusetts. Uh, this meeting was instigated by a couple of the elders of the Narragansett Indian tribe who had had a debate in their council recently at that time uh, as to what to do about the fact that development was encroaching on the areas where these structures were located. Uh And some of them said these structures are places of spirit energy. Let's allow the developers to go ahead and destroy them and reap the negative consequences of disturbing that energy. And others said, no, let's instead see if we can find some towns and some archaeologists with whom we can partner to preserve them. And they debated this in council, and the latter opinion eventually won out. So on the basis of that, the tribal medicine woman and the deputy tribal historic preservation officer of the tribe went up to this meeting with a couple of avocational archaeologists, and I was invited to the meeting as well. And we talked for a while. We went out and took a look at some sites. And the tribal medicine woman said, you know, wouldn't it be a nice thing if there could be an inventory of all of these sites somewhere so they could be better preserved? Uh And I said, that's an interesting idea. I think I can do that. Little did I realize what I was getting into because the numbers of these things, I had no expectation as to how many there would be. Uh, But in the course of the research that I did, really largely starting in 2012 and continuing to 2018, but it still continues to this day. Um, But what's in the book pretty much closes out at the end of 2018. Um, I've identified through numerous sources uh, 5,550 individual sites containing upwards of 45,000 structures. And putting all of that together uh, has turned out to be quite a task. Uh So that's how I got involved. Okay. And you got involved for all the right reasons, Uh, Mm -hmm. starting off with the inventory of What's you know uh, what we know? Uh, what's there? Mm-hmm. And okay. I have many many sources. Uh, in addition to Steve's major contributions and Barbara mm-hmm. and Patrick's, uh, there are well over a hundred other contributors to the volume in terms of my sources. And of course, I've also gone out and found some sites myself. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a lot of people who have contributed to this effort. Oh, uh, a couple of them have been guests on Nightlight, uh, Richard Thornton and uh, Glenn Kreisberg. Yep. As as well, you know, uh, you know they uh, were very in- informative uh, guests. So, so uh, Steve, where? Yeah, you're doing a lot of uh, research as well. Uh, you know, you're brought in, what are you contributing to Dr. Hoffman's uh, book, uh, Stone Prayers? Well, uh, I've predominantly uh, been documenting structures in Rhode Island, even though I live in Massachusetts. Uh, I make a trip once a week, as weather uh, permits, uh, to basically the Hopkinton, Rhode Island area. That's where I've been for the last couple of years. Uh, 
but I've sent uh, Dr. Hoffman uh, over 9,000 documented structures, and most of those, I believe, are in his book. And for the and for Rhode Island being the smallest state in the union, I think we're pretty high on the list, aren't we, Dr. Hoffman? As far as yeah, uh, sites Rhode Island has square. the highest the highest frequency of sites per square kilometer of any site any state in the in the region. However, oh. Massachusetts has a lot more sites because it's a bigger state. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, yeah. okay, so um, that, yeah, that might be uh, a, a really good segue into some of the features that you note uh, of all, uh, all the five thousand uh, five thousand plus sites is. Uh, you know, for dealing with Rhode Island, uh, you have to deal with a large body of water. Uh, you know, many of the other archaeological sites you're dealing with, uh, you know, from Georgia uh, up to Ontario. Uh, Quebec, it, not really Ontario. Or, or uh, uh, yeah. Quebec. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There, there, there are uh, you know the Great Lakes to deal with. Yeah. You know, just the positioning of some of the stone structures near, uh, uh, you know, like the headwaters of a stream or you know cr- creek or something like that. So, uh, it, it seems like water is consistently something that had uh, great importance to the Native Americans and it's part of the ritual uh, can, uh, you know the belief system and you know celebrations or you know, all, all the activities that they had going on uh, can can you uh, d- discuss uh, how Frequently, water is found associated with these archaeological sites. Well, what the Narragansett medicine woman told me at that initial meeting, and this is a direct quote, is our people like to build these things where water flows in two directions. Hmm. And what that means, as I interpret it, one of two possibilities. One possibility is places where there is a boundary between drainage systems yeah. so that the water flows from on high downslope one way, downslope the other way. The other possibility that I explored where water flows in two directions is tidal. That is that at high tide, the water flows upstream and at low tide, it flows downstream. And so I looked at the distances that these sites were to the tidal boundary. And that seemed to work all right, not as well as the watersheds did. But uh, there's something to that to be said about that, I think. So that's one of the things that they have. Now, here in New England, we have a lot of small rivers and a few large rivers. Uh-huh. Um Further south, they don't have as many small ones. But um, my boundary for the project was those river systems that flow into the Atlantic Ocean, not into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's entirely arbitrary on my part, but I had to draw a line somewhere. Okay. And Mark, uh, in, in, in Rhode Island, um, I've documented uh, quite a few structures uh, near bodies of water, whether they're ponds, small streams, uh, possibly a big lake. Uh, swamps, too. Yeah, yeah. Swamps, too. And, mm-hmm. and basically, uh, this is where you find a lot of the diversity of, of structures because water was extremely important, and they would – the natives would build their structures and pray 
not only for the rains to come, but also if they had livestock for their herd to be increased, they'd pray for the health of their families and their overall well-being of the, if, if they're on a farm, and failure to do so, the happy ceremonies would risk droughts and floods and blights and other calamities. But a lot of these structures, structures were right near or possibly even in the water. And um, mm. so we, 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 we found that these are very, very compelling. Mm-hmm. And that's just one of probably 15 different types of structures uh, that we've located in Rhode Island. And uh, having worked with uh, Dr. Hoffman since 2012 and James and Mary Gage, who have also written a wonderful book called Land of a Thousand Carns, which is basically about an area in Hopkinton, Rhode Island, a 14-acre parcel of land that was getting ready to be sold and then divided into uh, places where homes were going to be built. Uh, someone notified the town, the town came out, said, and, and saw all these structures on this 14 acre piece of property and said, we need to buy this piece of property. And then they personally asked me if I would help them document the structures on this piece of property. And we were able to document 1,024 precise structures of different diversity, sizes, shapes uh, on this particular piece of property. And now uh, they're trying to get it into the National Historic Register of uh, Ceremonial Sites. And uh, so we're pretty proud of that. And also just south of that, we actually documented another 1,200 structures uh, and these two places were owned by the same family at one time, the Lawton Foster family mm-hmm. and their descendants. Um, so, so it's pretty uh, pretty interesting. Now, one of the things that Steve referenced, which I think I don't I don't want to let it go by, okay. um, before the Europeans arrived the native people did not have anything by way of livestock. That is, they had domesticated dogs and that was it. Mm -hmm. But once the Europeans arrived, native people did begin to adopt livestock, particularly sheep and goats. And one of the things that we've come to realize about these structures is that while they are definitely, native and I can can go into that more detail okay. uh, a lot of them appear to be native post European contact and that's true of that's the right. Hopkinton site as well right. uh, the gauges actually speculate that the Lawton Fosters might actually have been native I don't personally think so but I think that they may have been sympathetic and they may have allowed Native people to come onto their property to do ceremony. Yeah, and, and I I just like to uh, back up for a minute and, and uh, you know, present a rejoinder to uh, what Steve was talking about, and, and you know, with the swamps, uh, you know, when uh, we had uh, Jason Gerald as a guest, and you know, he was t- uh, talking about. Um, the uh, so some of the earthen mounds in the Ohio Valley uh, were, were built near uh, swamps, and, and uh, there's like the underwater panther. Uh, may that that concept may have fit into. Uh, the positioning of the mound near the swamp, and um, it, it was very, it, it's very interesting that as you, know, you, you drive up and down the Ohio River, how, how many of these um, Adina and Hopewell mounds were built near some kind of swamp, 
Barshi area, you know, Dr. Webb talking about um, the uh, early Adena um, uh, Dover mound that was uh, made from a nearby swamp. So th- 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 Cahokia. This, Cahokia is built that way too. Uh, uh, okay, well, yeah, I was just, uh, you know, Trying to uh, uh, demonstrate that th- there is a connection between the building of some type of monument to these swamps, and yeah, that tradition really goes way back, in, you know, 500 BC at least. And you know, Dr. Hoffman's saying you know, it's like kind of like uh, you know a lot of these stone structures in in the uh, stone prayers uh, book is like post contact time. So you know that might be almost two thousand years of continuously using the the same type of concept. Uh, it, it was like a unified idea. Uh, but, you know, between the uh, New England sites and uh, uh, the uh, Ohio Valley, and you know, even going down to uh, northern Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, the um, absolute dates that we now have on these structures, and there are about twenty of them, uh, will take us back to around four thousand five hundred years ago. Wow! So that's the oldest that we have. That's not to say that that's the oldest that there were. It's just that we don't have very many radiocarbon dates on these structures. Now, there's an exciting new technique that's being developed, uh, which will allow the dating of surface crystals on rocks. And once that becomes popularized uh, so that more labs are doing it, uh, this may become a very powerful source of information about these structures. Because usually, in order to do radiocarbon dating, you've got to have something with charcoal. Mm-hmm. And that usually involves doing some excavation. And doing some excavation at sacred sites is not something that is favored right. by our Native friends. They would prefer right. that these things be left as they are. And I have to agree with them. Okay. And, and you know, with, with all the water... That uh, we've been discussing, and it's, you know, like uh, you know, the Rhode Island is basically cut in two with you know, by the Narragansett Bay, and you know, some of the other, uh, you know, the Great Lakes uh, to the uh, but uh, a lot last. Of these, yeah, but a lot of these sites are also on hilltops, mm-hmm. even yeah, on I, bedrock outcrops. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, uh, what I was gonna say is, yeah, there, you, you real in all your documentation of the the positioning of these sites, there there really isn't much uh, right there along any of the shorelines. It, it, uh, no, it, not so much. It, it, yeah, and you know, uh, you know, my next qu- question it, it, it w- was. Uh, there, there are a number of places that you document that are higher in elevation. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about you know what if you know people well, haven't been walking through the woods and up up on top of the hills? You know uh, what are they finding up on uh, top of the hills? Well, certainly you're getting the same kind of structures as you get further down on the slopes. The the slope sloping land is one of the most frequent places you're going to find these, um, even more than on hilltops or in valleys or on shorelines. But um, one thing that you can notice if you look at the distribution maps is that south of the glacial margin, which is more or less runs through the middle of Pennsylvania and northern New Jersey and Long Island Sound, um, south of that, there are very few sites on the coastal plain, and there's a very good reason for that. No rocks. Okay. So instead, 
they are when they are building on the coastal plain, they're building earthen mounds and they're building shell mounds further south. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same is true in the Ohio Valley. Uh, is that you don't have as many rocks, so you're going to build out of other materials. Mm-hmm. And right. I did not look at earthen mounds or shell mounds in my study at all, because that wasn't what I was setting myself to do. Let's put it that way. But once you get up to the glacial margin, uh, you are going to find sites along the coast. So there are quite a number of sites fairly close to the coast in coastal Connecticut, and Steve has got a whole cluster of them in Newport that he's found that are pretty close to the coast. And you can find them on the islands in uh, Buzzards Bay, but not on Cape Cod for some reason. Uh, Mm -hmm. When I speak with Ramona Peters, who is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Mashpee, she claims that her people never built these things. And she may be right for Mashpee. But uh, further west, as you move into bu- into uh, uh, Buzzards Bay and Falmouth, there is a cluster of them, and then out into the islands, and then, of course, everywhere else in Massachusetts. But for some reason, Cape Cod was not a place where they built these. Uh, it, uh, it, Steve, you know, we just heard, uh, heard a little bit about uh, – you know, islands like Martha's Vineyard. Uh, it, 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 it's surprising that a, a big island like that really didn't have uh, any of these kind of structure. And, oh, but it does. Oh, it, I, I, oh Martha's Vineyard does. Okay. And tuck it, not so much. I, 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 okay, I said the wrong one. And yeah, you, know, you said there you know, in Stone Prairie, you know, like there's not like a whole lot of documentation on other islands, and yeah, there's a little bit on 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 Noshon Island and uh, a few on the other islands as well, uh, but not on Nantucket for some reason. Yeah, I I, I just I, that, that's a really fascinating subject uh, uh, to me. And I, I don't know if there's a regional difference or uh, it, it's just something that we have not yet rediscovered. But it, it, the, the use of islands uh, it, it seems like th- there was something really sacred of, about them. And the, I, I've you know, been, been learning a, a little bit um, – about some of the uh, islands in the Ohio River Valley, and there, there's starting to be uh, a, a pattern emerging. It's you know it's still in its infancy, but uh, there really does to be uh, seem to be the, the use of all landforms were part of uh, cultural. Uh, a- activities uh, that are viewed as sacred, some something like that. that uh, you know, these um, uh, uh, people from uh, s- so many different cultures were doing their uh, uh, rituals all across the landscape. Yep, it, it, it's very yep. interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, but I, there I, are I, apparently I, places which they avoided. For this, I, I also and think that um, the uh, each native tribe had their own particular uh, reasons for uh, constructing uh, these stone structures uh, for different reasons, different sizes, different shapes, and where they would place them. I also. Back in 2014, I talked to the tribal preservation officer at the time, John Brown. My first mm-hmm. question to him was about, uh, I said, what about all these stone walls here in Rhode Island? And he told me, quote, Steve, our people have been working with stone for thousands of years. He says, when the colonists came, a great many of these stone walls were already here. 
Mm-hmm. So that should tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, all the structures uh, that I've certainly located uh, in, you know, in Rhode Island, in and around Rhode Island. Uh, well, when when Daniel Gukin, who was the first Indian commissioner to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, visited the Narragansett, he remarked, this is already back in the 1640s, uh, he remarked on the skill that the Narragansett had in making stone fences. And there was a native man at that time known as Stonewall John who oh. was doing this sort of thing. And the tradition continued and continues right up to the present. John Brown himself is a stonemason in addition to being the tribal historic preservation officer. So that's a long-standing tradition among the Narragansetts. Yeah. So, now, so one of I, the things, yeah. yeah, one of the things that you begin to look at if you start having the eye for these structures is that some of the stone walls do not run straight. They sort of wiggle around like, you know, I mean, I think they're serpent effigies. And frequently the serpent effigies are associated with water. So you'll see a stone row that sort of wiggles around and then heads for water. And it doesn't seem to mark a property boundary or anything like that. Uh, I've even seen some stone walls where it undulates vertically, high and low, and I think that's also a serpent effigy, because the serpent was important to these people. Uh And, you know, you're not going to be likely to find colonists building stuff in the shape of serpents, because they didn't like them. Right. It, and, and the serpent was a symbol of evil for them. Yeah, and you know there were probably uh, the you know colonists are more interested in dealing with uh, well, and, and straight lines, you know, yeah, it's like and right that, angles. yeah, the right angles, parallel walls, yeah. or so, something like that. Right. Uh, just yep. uh, this is my property within this little square. Uh, yes, yeah, so you, know, you know the uh, arguments that you, know, you make a convincing case for is that you know these more recent uh, structures that you know were found here are native. They, they just aren't uh, consistent with any kind of building pattern brought. Uh, over to America with Miles Standish on you know, in the, in the Mayflower uh, Mariners. No, no, not at all. You know, and you know, Mark, um, uh, I think there's hundreds of thousands, I believe, hundreds of thousands of miles of stone walls in New England, and it's impossible for the colonists to arrive in 1620, and we're basically here you know, for a couple of 250 years to have built those stone walls. Because once they found better land for farming, they moved from Rhode Island out to the Ohio Valley. And when that happened, the displaced Native Americans came back into the area, reclaimed the land, reclaimed the farming area, and then began to repractice you know their ceremonial uh, activities with with the construction of a lot of these different types of uh, carns or or uh, stone structures, depending on what it was that they were praying for or wanted to happen. And uh, but you can always tell, like you might say to yourself, well, how do you, how do you know? If that is a stone structure or if that is a stone pile, a field clearing pile. Now, usually field clearing piles will be of the same design, like a mound on a ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll, they'll be composed of uh, usually medium and large stones. There'll be really no large boulders and, and all the, the stones the, will be. And the arrangement is going to be haphazard. Right. Uh, they'll, they'll be the, the stones will be of the same size, basically. Uh, the large piles 
uh, are easy to spot uh, because they're way out of the way, maybe at the end of a farm field, maybe at the corner where two walls meet. Um, and they, and those would contain uh, a variety of, of different stones. But ceremonial Karn sites are always characterized by a diversity of different Karn designs. And I know James and Mary Gage, they've located 14 specific designs in Rhode Island. And uh, what, in fact, we actually discovered a new Karn design in Rhode Island and in southeastern Connecticut. It's called an opened end, closed end Karn. And but we have is, some of those in Massachusetts, too. You remember the one I showed you in Ashland? which is also an example of that. So there's some up this way, too. All right. Well, it's in a very uh, very limited area. And yeah. it's usually one side. One side is, uh, is, a, is a vertical wall, and then yep. it slants to the ground. Right. And they, huh. and they believe that that's a structure where people would come by and deposit a stone uh what the reason may be, we don't know. It could be for Thanksgiving, maybe sending out a message, maybe it's a memorial, maybe it's for spirit use. Uh, we, 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 really, we really don't know. And sometimes the Native Americans are reluctant to let us know the precise meaning of these structures. And I believe that's because for the last 400 years, they've been they've been uh, kicked in the face, you know, by the Caucasian, uh, you know, people, and so trying to build that, you know, that uh, frame of trust takes a very very long time. Yep. Which That's for Dr. Sure. Hoffman, myself, James and Mary Gage have been trying to do with the way we approach our documentation of these structures. And I've always adopted a motto of do no harm when I'm out in the woods. And it's important for me to make sure that when I document a structure that I have this mindset. Number one, I know what I'm looking at, but I don't know what other people are going to see unless I can make sure that I send measurements, front, side, height, lots of pictures from all four sides of, of the structure, a couple of pictures from the top, and also anything unusual about the structure itself uh, that is that would be worth looking into. Maybe quartz stones, maybe a uh, perch stone uh, on the structure itself. And then, very important, an accurate GPS point so that structure can be plotted. Mm -hmm. Now, in order for Dr. Hoffman, James and Mary Gage, or anybody else that looks at this information, to have an idea of how this structure was constructed, it needs to be, and I say this uh, with great respect and honor, and I also have the, um, the blessing of Doug Harris to clean these structures very carefully, which means removing the debris easily. Okay, sometimes some stones are jostled, and sometimes some stones will fall out of place, but they're put back precisely. Because to get an idea of how it was constructed may give meaning to those that look at all this information, what was intended by the, uh, the person 
or if it's, if it's a lodge structure, by the community. So that's why they are cleaned with love, with respect, with honor. Once that's done, they are covered back up, and I move on to the next one. So I leave no footprint at all where somebody would say, well, what happened here? Everything goes back to the way that it was. But it's important to get the best accurate information about these structures so that Dr. Hoffman can make his determinations about what is there so that James and Mary Gage can look at the information, make their determinations, and also being right there, I add commentary. I might see something about a certain structure or on a certain structure, and I will put that in the information that I send to both Dr. Hoffman and James and Mary Gage. And to the Narragansett as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and there's there's uh, an important protocol to, that needs to be observed here, and that is that while this this information, which is very precise as to location, is given to a limited number of parties, we do not give out this information to the general public because that could result in damage to the sites. So. Um, When I represent these things in public presentations, I will show them as being no more accurate than a one-kilometer circle or square because that way someone who was looking for them could not actually necessarily find them and destroy them because there are people out there that that are intent on doing that sort of thing. Uh, The only people who will eventually receive the exact information would be the tribes themselves on request and the State Historic Preservation offices insofar as those offices are receptive to that. Now, Steve, I think you send all of your stuff also to the Rhode Island Historic Preservation Commission, don't you? Yes. Uh, Yeah. James and Mary Mary Gage. Yeah, they they file a form. They, right. they fill out a site report. Sometimes right. it's 20, 40, 50, 60, 80 pages long. Yep. They send it yep. to the archaeologist, right. and they keep it on file. Mm-hmm. They're very Whereas, well, yeah, and, and that is the case in, in many of the states in the eastern seaboard. Unfortunately, it is not the case in Massachusetts, where our state archaeologist is um, insistent that none of these things could be native at all. And uh, that's that's very bad because it means that they're not getting protected here. Oh. It, 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 since, you know, we've been talking about these n- numerous thousands of sites all across the eastern seaboard. Mm-hmm. I don't know how they're not seen as native but uh you know I, I will come back to that uh and you know steve was talking about all, you know you had the thousands of miles of these stone uh walls and you know you get you know the uh cotton mather showing up on the shores and you know uh, the, and the natives leave and you know then when the colonists need to actually uh start growing stuff to feed themselves you know they they leave for ohio and, and uh, native americans come come back and uh inhabit their ancestral lands it, do is, is there some kind of way to figure out the population size that you know, could build this many miles you know, thousands of miles of these stone walls is is that possible that's it's a very debatable question in archaeology as to what the pre-european population of the continent may have been uh there are wide ranges of estimates uh but they also had a lot of time to do it so if people were here for four thousand six thousand twelve thousand 15,000 years, 
as we now think that they are, uh, they had a lot of time to do these things. You know, as compared, as Steve said, the relatively brief time that colonists have been here, only a few hundred years. Okay, uh, I, that makes sense. I I I just didn't know. It's uh, both of you have presented some really uh, fascinating I- I- information. It just makes you you know, wonder how how many people were actually living on North America when uh, you know the Mayflower showed up. I I, I just I, I I don't know. I I've never read anything about that. Yeah, well, I mean, there are, as I said, it's it's a matter of dispute among archaeologists as to how to estimate that. And it's very hard to do because, of course, no one was keeping those kind of records. But uh, one thing is for certain, uh, once the colonists began to interact with the native population, disease, death was rampant among the native tribes. Yeah. Uh, some tribes, 80, 90 percent, were wiped out in, in a small manner of time. So I think and it that's, was uh, – Yeah, that's after, because they didn't have immunities to the right. European diseases. Yeah, so after – Especially I, 16, smallpox 12, and 16, cholera. 13, yeah, right. So, and and your – both of your research – you, know, you have you know, uh, you know heard about the uh, uh, close ended cairns, and we get these mm-hmm. um, samples of the pyramidal uh, uh, cairns, which are you know, different from the you know, a little bit more rounded ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there? Uh, an astronomical association with the, the diversity of uh, cairns, or is that uh, something that is just beginning to be investigated now? Well, Roger Williams, in his writings about the Narragansetts, observed that many native people in that area would lie out in the open outside of their villages at night to be able to look at the stars. And he commented that they were more conversant with the different star patterns than were most of his fellow um, uh, England-based people. So these people certainly were well aware of the stars and their Mm -hmm. configurations. And they were also well aware of the seasons of the year and the equinoxes and the solstices. We do not have as complete information as we might about these structures with respect to that. But where we do have information, there are some directions that are certainly favored. Um, Winter solstice sunrise is one of the most important of them. Um, and also summer solstice sunrise, um, the locations of the Pleiades, the setting of the Milky Way, these things are well w- observed and well documented in native uh, folklore so that we know that they were interested in them and they are still interested in them. So uh, these are some examples. And yes, there are some structures which are very deliberately placed so as to take advantage of these phenomena, and for the and for the very fact that there are four, at least fourteen, there could be fifteen different types of uh, structures in Rhode Island, uh, makes one wonder that with all this variety, that we know then that these were used for different reasons. They had different purposes depending on where they were mm-hmm. located. Uh, and I'll just give you a quick quick run through of, of some of these basic designs. There's a, a corn that's built just on the ground. There's a split boulder. Some people believe the split was a portal to the underworld and that spirits could come in and out 
of the split boulder that had stones in it, the open closed carn, niches, which were uh, structures built low to the ground that had an either opening on the top, but certainly an opening on the bottom where you could could make offerings to the spirits, uh, you know, tobacco or, or corn or whatever, um, enclosures. Sometimes they were circular. Sometimes they were, uh, you know, four-sided. Sometimes they were attached to stone walls. Sometimes they were attached to a boulder. Sometimes they were um, semicircle. Then, of course, chambers. Only found uh, a few in Hopkinton. Uh, standing stones, specifically uh, shaped, as Curtis was saying, probably pointing to an important direction, maybe a sunrise, maybe a, a you know, a, maybe a, a, a moon rise or a moon setting or something. Then we have perched stones. That's a stone that would be raised up with one stone underneath where you could actually see through it or a balanced stone. Uh, you'd have a small stone on top with a larger stone uh, on top of that, balanced, and you'd have pedestal pedestal stones where you'd have a larger stone uh, placed up on three or four stones off the ground. Uh, Manitou stones would be a stone that you would look at that would have the shape uh, of a human being or could be an animal, but mainly a human being that would that would basically show the the torso, the shoulders, and the shape of the head. And then uh, the again, as uh, Curtis was talking about, serpent effigies, stones aligned in a uh, in arrangement uh, like a snake, or uh, a turtle, a lot of turtles, right? Mm-hmm. Turtle, right? I've actually seen a couple of. Fascinating, but those are some of the. And then you, you'd have uh, uh, boulders uh, on top of a large base boulder. Sometimes you'd have one. Sometimes you just have two. Sometimes you'd have three, and all these would be within five or six feet of one another. And you'd say to yourself, "Why would somebody who's fighting for survival waste their time putting one stone on this base boulder?" Two stones on that base boulder, and then three stones on this base boulder, all within a ten foot radius. That would tell me that that this was constructed by a Native American or a member of a Native American tribe for a specific purpose. Do do, do we know the function, or is that just still all, well? Uh, what we have okay. to understand. Well, uh, I have had the great good fortune of making contact with a person who is of Native ancestry, mm-hmm. who was trained as a child by his great aunt in the meanings of these things and also in the language. So he is fluent in the language. And he has supplied me with Algonquian names for most of the structure types that uh, that the Steve has just mentioned. So uh, that is one way that we have in to understanding these. So, for example, there's a type of cairn that is generally very well made and very carefully placed and pretty large. And in the language, these are referred to as Wawanakusuks or Wawanakwasiks, depending upon the dialect. Now, these, my informant tells me, are places that were used to commemorate the passing of some important person, especially if they had died violently. Because what that does in the native view is to create a kind of an imbalance in the earth energy. And so what you do is you create one of these to restore the balance. And mm-hmm. those are a very special type of uh, stone pile where or cairn. Whereas the smaller ones, he says, which are called katantooks, are um, more individual.
individual ceremonies or prayers. So there are some differences, and um, they are known by the native people, or at least by some of the native people. Um, And while they may not always be willing to tell us what they are, sometimes they do. And that's of great benefit in this research. And and just to build on what uh, Curtis just said, uh, that is where building trust and respect between us and the Native tribes is very important. We need to yep. show them. We need to show them how we respect and honor what their ancestors had built. And the only way we can do that is to show them what we do as far as documentation that we do no harm, that everything goes right back to what it used to be, and we lovingly and gratefully, graciously give them this information in hopes. Uh, that that they appreciate what we're doing because uh, Dr. Hoffman, James and Mary Gage, and myself and others, that we we certainly want to be good stewards of all the information of all the structures that we document. Well, I think that's what what or yeah, you and Dr. Hoffman have done for the last hour is increased our understanding and that's you know one of the foundations of you know just bridging some you know, uh, cultural differences uh, you know just understanding where each one's coming from and you know we're just glad to use our forum to um, in, 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 Improve communications, and I, 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 and you know this uh, learning about uh, restoring balance. It, 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 yeah, I think what we've learned tonight um, is a you know, you've presented a great insight into something that we don't know uh, most. Uh, you know, white people don't know a whole lot about, and you know, you're, you're getting um, um, improving our understanding. And, you know, well, that, like is, add, that is our goal. That's one of our goals, anyway. Yeah, uh, no, I think both of you are doing a very good job. And um, yeah, yeah, uh, and just to continue with. Uh, what Dr. Hoffman said has given us a couple examples of uh, the Algonquin word for, you know, say the balanced rocks and you know, several other um, Algonquin words for you know, uh, you know, different chambers or cairns. And uh, uh, you, you are using. Uh, that you know, specific term for a balanced rock, uh, it, you know. So, you know, you are working with um, uh, 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 people who are uh, still fluent in the language. Uh, you know, the language is still uh, surviving into today's world. And for that matter, so is the practice. Okay. In other words, there are still people in the tribes who continue to practice offerings at these stones and even to build new ones. Um, After the um, meeting that we had that I mentioned to you, um, Doug Harris and a local fellow by the name of Tim Fall and I went out to a location which is shortly a short walk from Tim's house to document uh, a a site with many of these structures. And so we, you know, we did our thing, you know, we mapped them in, we measured them, and this is exactly the sort of thing that Steve is is talking about. And um, 
then we left them be. And then Doug invited a group of Native people from the United South and East Tribes, which is the local, you know, the, the regional uh, consortium of federally recognized tribes from Texas to, to Maine, uh, to a, a meeting, and he brought them out to this site. After that, we, you know, Tim came to discover that there were now more piles than we had documented. So what that tells us is that the practice is still alive, that people are still doing this. Hmm. Okay, good. Now, now we uh, just want to just deviate just for a second. Uh, I want to read something sent to me four years ago by uh, the assistant tribal preservation officer, Doug Harris, because in Rhode Island, well, like in anything in life, uh, ignorance is the giant killer. If people don't know what's around or what's important, they usually will either leave it alone or they'll destroy it. Now, word is had gotten around in Rhode Island that if you had some kind of native structure or was found out to be a native structure or series of structures on your property, that the Narragansett tribe, if they found out, could come in and claim your territory, claim your land because of their supposedly native right. This to me by Doug Harris because I had a couple of people that were concerned because once you destroy something, that's it. It's gone forever. Right. Now, yeah. This is Doug Harris. He says, it is our policy to support private landholders in being good stewards of these ancient cultural resources. Our office is available to offer preservation advice and assistance to landholders who seek to improve their abilities as cultural resource stewards. We are aware of landholder gossip about the presumed, quote, powers, unquote, of the tribes. But we have no ability to, quote, take, unquote, the land of anyone who has a ceremonial landscape within their holdings. Good luck with your work. If I can be of an assistant, to a landholder, and they would like to meet. It would be my honor to discuss, you know, your findings with them. Sincerely, Doug Harris. So, whenever I get the chance, and I see people, I try to educate them. I said, "Look, you've got some wonderful stuff in your property, but if you allow us to document, I mean, don't worry that somewhere along the line." that you're going to get a knock at the door and the, Na- and the Narragansett tribe is going to take your land. They can't do it. They gave up that right to do so to become a federally recognized tribe. So, but that's, that's the perception that if I have something that looks Native American and it looks like it's important, I'll just keep it quiet. Or if I get a chance, I'll plow it under. That way, you know, uh, that way they feel like they're protected. But in the process... They're ruining uh, history. Because once it's gone, like I said, it's gone forever. Yeah, I, I wanted to comment on that, too. There was a situation that took place here in Massachusetts a number of years ago, actually not that long ago, at a, a location called Sandus Field, which is way out in the western part of the state, where the uh, Federal Energy um, Reclamation um, uh, Commission, Regulatory Commission, uh, decided that that would be an ideal place to put a natural gas pipeline. And it went right through a state forest, which was not such a good thing to do after all. Um, and there was a lot of local protest. And it turned out that there were 73 cairns on that property. Wow. And um, what FERC offered to do was, all right, we'll – we'll take apart these cairns to get them out of the way and then we'll rebuild them after we're done with our project. And Doug Harris commented on that, 
then you will have destroyed a sacred site and right. created an artistic representation of a sacred site. So that's, in other words, you, as Steve says, you can never put it back. It, it, is, it is disturbed. It is destroyed. It cannot be put back the way it was. It loses its integrity. And right. that's Absolutely. why it's so important to make sure these places are preserved as they are. It, 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 it's it, you know it's the um, letter that Steve read. It it, it it really does seem like Doug is uh, going out of his way to work with people and you know, promoting understanding and. Uh, education from his uh, people's perspective. Uh, he, he, you know, he's not being you know, really aggressive about it. it. It's just, you know, he, he, it sounds like he's uh, uh, just having, uh, uh, he is willing to sit, sit down with people and uh, talk about the situation and, and uh, about uh, uh, you know property rights and his ancestors, you know burial ground. It, uh, it, it sounds like he's going about things in a commendable way. Well, he's taken that on as his personal and tribal responsibility. Mm-hmm. So he recognizes that. No, it, it, it sounds very reasonable, and you know, I, uh, you know, there, are, I, I've, you know, uh, you know, when I was involved, you know, uh, in a couple of these projects, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, we uh, approached one homeowner about, you, you know, what, do you have wishes, or, you know? What you want to do with this property after you know, you're gone? You know, you, know, you have some sample where you have some options where uh, several of these state agencies are glad to work w- with you. And yeah, he, he he was just very adamant about I want the mound preserved. Um, and it's not my ancestors who are buried here, but I. I yeah, you know, I've been offered a lot of money to excavate it, and I'm not going to do it because it, it'd be like driving a uh, bulldozer through, you know, the graveyard where your you know, parents are uh, buried. Mm-hmm. And yep. and you know, he 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 he's just a white guy, but yeah, this is his, you know, has been. And his family's property for a long time, and he he's doing everything he can to uh, uh, preserve it. He, he may not have realized that there were th- this many state agencies who were uh, available to help him with uh, at least having some right of ways, uh, which you know would r- really minimize. Uh, yeah, the loss of the use of the farmland, but you know, it, it, it sounds like Doug and uh, you know, uh, like Shippo offices are very willing to uh, minimize any kind of impacts on uh, the, the homeowners. Uh, uh, just the, the the main point is to preserve the cairn or mound or you know, whatever cultural feature it is. Well, that says may be in Rhode Island, but unfortunately, it is not the case in Massachusetts. Yeah, and that's one of the many reasons I go to Rhode Island. Yeah, but but I know that we talked about this before. We need to continue to build that trust between us and the tribes, because as we do, I believe. They will open up and allow us to understand the meanings of these 
structures as well as continually give us their blessing on cleaning them with respect, sending them all the information, and then, you know, being a, a good steward by covering everything up again so as to look like it's uh, pristine. Um, mm. It, 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 well, it, it, Steve, you just mentioned you know, we need to it, it improve the uh, understanding of the meaning and you know, in stone prayers, um, uh, there's one of the plates with the – there was a straight line of a whole bunch of – Oh, the heaven effort line. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, plate fifty, and you, you get a straight line basically going from uh, the the shore straight across. Uh, it's uh, central western part of Connecticut, or uh, and you know Glenn Kreisberg, uh You know when he was a guest, discussed the you know the same line. You know, what was you know, if we're you know going to be looking at understanding the meaning of all these cairns uh, being in a straight line, you know, we uh, for a, a very long distance, you know, we also need to understand that uh, the, the builders of these cairns ha- had a very sophisticated uh, 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 understanding of engineering. It's like you, you, know, you can't do uh, that kind of stuff today without using uh, you know laser transits. Right. Well, um, and they're knocking that out. You know, for you know the well, hundreds first, of years first before. Of all, okay. First of all, many of the sites on the Hamanasset line are located at high places where you can see from one to the next one. Mm-hmm. And so it would not have been too difficult technologically to be able to do that kind of viewing, especially if they built fires on the tops of the hills so you could see the fire from one to the next. So that's one idea out there. Uh, secondly, that line points directly at winter solstice sunrise. And in fact, there is on one of the sites, there is a marvelous turtle effigy, which also points right towards winter solstice sunrise. And from the top of that hill, you can actually see right across Long Island Sound. So these are advantage points. And that's that's part of what's going on there. Now, I've talked with the person who has introduced the idea of the Hamanasset line about what would happen if you walked off the line, how far you would continue to be finding monuments. And it turns out that he actually works for his town as a water commissioner. And so he has actually walked over all of the town pretty much. And so he knows that there are not structures very much outside of that line that it really is a line so that's something i have not found anything quite like that anywhere else so that's that's an interesting kind of anomalous situation but it's fascinating to think that they could have done that now he has also tried to trace the line out all the way out into the catskills But there you're going to run across a problem because while on a map you can do that, maps are flat and the surface of the earth is not. And at that range, you're going to run into problems with the curvature of the earth that will uh, make these determinations trickier. Okay. Well, it's... Yeah, the uh, map is interesting and mm-hmm. yeah and you also make a, a reference to uh some 
early documentation where uh, uh, people like Thomas Jefferson and John Smith also were intrigued by uh, 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 these structures. You, you know, what what were some of the early colonists? Uh, thinking of these monuments in the uh, Tidewater area? Well, the one thing we do know is that John Smith uh, in 1642, uh, 24 rather, traveled to a number of Powhatan villages, and he observed that there were these stone altars, which they told him were called pokerances, uh, and that they were made of quartz, and uh, that they were used as c- ceremonial offering places. Um, those things um, were – he was the first European that I've been able to find to document these. But after that, quite a number of people throughout the region documented these things, and they all say about the same thing which is that the native people of their day would divert from where they were traveling to go to one of these places, maybe a quarter of a mile off the path, and deposit an extra stone there. And that Mm -hmm. custom was still being observed as late as the end of the 19th century, because we have accounts all the way up to that time of native people actually continuing to place these. Now, the first minister to the Indians of Martha's Vineyard, uh, Thomas Mayhew Jr., was so liked by his converts that they built him a stone pile. And when he found out what they were doing, he said, no, 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 don't build it for me, build it for Jesus. And they said, well, okay. Um, but, um, he then took some of his converts on ship to bring them to England to show off what he had done. His ship was sunk in the North Atlantic and all hands perished. And when the native people found out that he was figured out that he wasn't coming back, they continued to add to the stone pile. It's still there today. And we have an account from 1923, uh, of, um, William Norton, who wrote a history of Martha's Vineyard, who says that when he was a boy, which must be back in the 1880s, 1890s, his family had a native woman as a a maidservant. And when they were traveling along a particular road that led by that particular stone pile, she would, in fact, bring a quartz cobble and place it on the pile. And that's something that she continued to do in observance of Mayhew and and so forth. Now, these are Christianized Indians, but they are still building stone piles. And I I think in Squire and Davis's uh, monuments in the Mississippi Valley, uh, they uh, note that uh, that uh, uh, leaving uh, a rock on a uh, an existing stone pile uh, was still going on uh, up until like you know what the 1820s at, mm-hmm. at least in the uh, central part of Ohio. Yep, yep, well, no doubt. You know, so this is this is a widespread, ongoing tradition. Just to add to uh, uh, Curtis's uh, wonderful story there, I, w- I want to read you something else. Uh, this is a quote from Reverend Hawley. Quote, oh, yeah. Observed in every part of the country and among every tribe of Indians, heaps of stones and sticks, unquote. Most people are familiar with the well-known Great Barrington slash Stockbridge trailside Carn. But few know that all of the tribes in southern New England built and used trailside cairns as the quote mentions. The stones placed in the trailside cairns 
were offerings that were built over long periods of time. Yep. And the thing about Hawley is that when he and his buddy were traveling into the Skohari Valley in New York with an Indian guide, uh, they noticed the guide doing this, and they asked him why, and he gave them an evasive answer. That is, he said something like, oh, well, my father always told me to to always do this, or um, it's our tradition to do this. Uh, and others say, you know, when they're asked about this, they, they claim that they don't know. But one of the things you have to know about Hawley is that he was a minister. And the ministers were very intent on making sure that the, the Indians did not practice their religion, but instead practiced what they thought religion ought to be. And the Indians had figured this out. And so when asked questions about this, they pretended not to know. And that's where some of the the idea that they don't know what they're talking about comes from. Because you hear that from certain quarters. is, Oh, this is just something that they made up recently in order to try to get land back. No, 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 no. This is something that has been in their tradition, but they've kept it secret. And one of the reasons they've kept it secret and is sort of an example of this is that if you look at the place names that are given to these by the colonists, quite a lot of them are associated with the devil. So you've got Devil's Den and Devil's mm-hmm. Lodge and Devil's Footprint and Devil's Dance Room and so forth and so on, all up and down the East Coast, is that there were associations of these sites, which were places of native worship, with devils and with witches and with things like that. They were places of avoidance for the colonists. That's one of the ways we know that they didn't build them because, you know, colonists are not going to build things in the shape of serpents. That's for sure. Right. That's a good, uh, you know, and, and, good, good and point. Even, and even uh, when the some of the natives were converted supposedly to Christianity, they had to dress in the, uh, the traditional garb of the day. Uh, they would still, in the privacy of their own homes or huts or whatever, they would still practice in secret their old mm-hmm. traditions. Uh, you know, of course, out of the, out of the view of the the ministers and those that had converted them to Christianity. Yep. And, and you know, uh, you know, we have. Little uh, under forty minutes left, and I uh, still want to touch on some other uh, uh, topics. You know, uh, you know, we haven't really uh, discussed uh, artwork such as uh, petroglyphs, mm-hmm. and you know, you do have uh, you know. Uh, Sample you know plate twenty nine of the uh, Bellows Falls uh, yep. petroglyphs in Vermont. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, I, I assume that near a uh, river, it, it looks very intri- intriguing. It, 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 is there? Um, some. Deci- way to decipher the meanings of these uh, uh, artworks? Well, I would say that that would be for the Native people to decide whether they wish to share those interpretations with us. Um, the Bellows Falls one is not merely near a river. It is most of the time underwater. So oh. that picture was taken at a time when there had been a drawdown of the Connecticut River behind the dam there. And so that's the only way it was possible to be able to get at them and photograph them. Oh. So, uh, yeah. In, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so th- there are s- several faces. Uh, it, um, yep. yep. It, uh, it, are there more of these uh, depictions of human forms 
Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, other nearby rocks? Mm, well, not there, but there's another one upstream at Brattleboro, and then there are more of them along more along the coast than elsewhere, but there there are several other sites. Uh, there's a site in um, um, Dighton, Mass, uh, called Dighton Rock, uh, which, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about it, but a recently published book called a, The Place of Stone uh, pretty definitively clinches this as being a native place. Oh, so there, there are places like that. There's a location. There are some locations up in the coast of Maine at Damariscotta and at Emden that have multiple petroglyphs on them. And also further north into Nova Scotia, there's a, a lake in the middle of no, Nova Scotia called Lake Kajimkajik, which is just, you know, the eastern shore is just crawling with petroglyphs. And they are very well protected because the Mekomak uh, uh, people who live there, see to their protection. Okay, good. Uh, go ahead. You know, but they are being protected. Yeah, uh, Steve, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in, in the 9,580 to date structures that I've documented, I found one with a potential petroglyph. Mm-hmm. One. Uh, basically, I just don't See anything on, on the structures uh, that I document, and maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. But one other thing too that I want the listeners to understand is that my only purpose is to document structures and make sure that they are protected. I do not, number one, look for anything. I don't dig anything. I'm not rummaging through anything. I don't want to find anything. That's not my purpose for what I do. I just want to make sure we get the best information to the great researchers like Dr. Hoffman, to James and Mary Gage, so that they can look at this material, make some sense out of it, um, come to some conclusions, and then publish their works for other people to look at and to read and hopefully come to some consensus over a period of time with enough information. But at no time am I a treasure hunter, a grave robber. I don't care about any of that stuff. I don't, in fact, I don't want to, I always pray before I go out. I say, God, I don't want to find anything. Just let me document. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's on. I- Understandable, and you know, Doctor Hoffman. Yeah, there is. Um, you know, since we are talking about artwork and um, engineering, uh, you do uh, discuss that. There, there are some samples of uh, unique structures, and yeah, you, know, you mentioned uh, dams and aqueducts. And I, um, you know, when Carl yeah, I mean, I have a category that I call unique structures because mm-hmm. basically, when I'm doing quantitative analysis, which is what the book does, um, anything less than 20 of something is not going to be big enough for analysis. So I just have a catch-all category that's called unique structures. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a a useful thing to have. Uh, But that's, that's what that's about. Yeah. yeah, And you know, it's, you know, you're uh, studying, um, yes. You know, this prehistoric material, Uh, yeah, you know, there there might only be, you know, like you said, uh, just a handful of uh, samples. Yep. It, it's not mm-hmm. a massive amount of, you know, a, a regular pattern uh, you know, found throughout time. But yeah, you know, I've, I've heard, uh, I read in um, uh, Colonel Norris's uh, notes of his excavations and observations and the. Uh, 
Kanawha Valley, and and he mentioned th- that he thought there was a uh, uh, ancient dam in the uh, Kanawha Valley as well. I yeah that that uh, it, I, I've never read that anywhere else except for you know when I read uh, you know, Stone Prayers. And, and it's like uh, okay, there's you know, like this other sample uh, c- coming up of these uh, dams. You know, was there a, a far more advanced uh, uh, you know building program that go- going on at some indeterminate time well it does not take a great deal of advanced technology to create one of those things um i know of several examples i did not include dams as such too many of them in 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 the book but i know of some examples there's one on the ashwellet river in uh southern new hampshire another one on this the um I think it's the Sebastopol Cook River in Maine, where essentially what the native people did was to set stones in the river to narrow the course of the river. So it's like making a V mm-hmm. of stones. And then the fish are constrained so that they can only go through the V, and it's much easier to catch them that way. But that's, that does not require a lot of advanced technology to do. Okay, so it, uh, it, 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 you don't think there was anything uh, dealing with, uh, you know, like uh, river travel like we have today? It was more about food and you know, like may, maybe making oh, a certainly, muscle shoal? Certain, certainly they are traveling by river at sometimes at, at very great distances. Um, and they had canoes. You know, they could do that. They could get around very easily from place to place uh, by water, probably easier than overland. But that, again, that does not require a lot of technology. Oh, well, I just thought it was an interesting um, it, 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 you, know, you covered so, so many different aspects of uh, this time period, it, it was. I, I, I just don't see see the, the dam and aqueduct I, idea uh, brought up um, on, on yeah, many occasions. See, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm just glad you it, it included. Yeah, let, let me it. let me explain one thing here, and that is that there are 5,550 sites in the study. I have not visited every one of them by any means. I have visited quite a number of them but not the whole amount. And in the case of that aqueduct, I am dependent upon someone else's description for that. I have not ground verified that particular site. And so I want to be a little bit cautious about what is said about that. Uh, It could be that it is something that someone has misinterpreted. Okay. And, and, um yeah you know, we do find examples of petroglyphs and you know I've had uh, you know, uh, uh one or two exchanges of information with or well, I was e- e- email about in- information on petroglyphs from uh I think a sample came from Maine that uh, Mary and James Gage, you know, co- commented on. They sent me a, a old photo or a drawing of a, 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 a petroglyph. I, I forget the name of the site. It, yeah, that's I, probably Demarascada or Emden, because those I, are the two big ones. I, 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 that that uh, that's kind of ringing a bell. Um, but yeah, they were really helpful in saying, "Oh, okay, he, yeah, this might be the sample you're looking for." Uh, and and, and I, I, I think their work is um, has been v- very beneficial. 
But uh, you know, at, at what point do we start seeing the, these petroglyphs and some form of writing uh, appearing? Well, petroglyphs are not necessarily to be interpreted as a form of writing as such. In other words, they are organized markings. They may be intended to convey a particular message, in which case, you know, we don't know necessarily what the message was. But um, again, we re- rely on the informants, the native informants, to illuminate us about this if they care to do so. Uh, writing as such is something that was not found north of Mexico in North America until the Europeans came. Now, the Vikings certainly did have a form of right. I I think I want to call them the Norse rather than the Vikings because by the time they got here, they weren't Viking anymore. You understand? To vi- Viking is a verb. It's 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 going raiding. Um, it's not the name of a people. Um, but by that time, they had ceased doing that. But still, uh, they uh, certainly reached the northern coast of uh, Newfoundland Island, where they established a colony. And they very well may have traded or explored down the coast. And I would not be averse to thinking that they may have gotten as far as Narragansett Bay. But I'm also not willing to stand behind the authenticity of any of those small number of coastal inscriptions that are documented in the book. They are at such very different kinds of locations than everything else that they kind of stand out like a sore thumb. So there's something different. Uh, and one thing to add to that, um, I think you find the least amount of petroglyphs in the Northeast, and that's because of the hardness of the stone. It's very mm-hmm. difficult to, to chisel uh, into some of this granite, this quartz, whereas mm-hmm. if you head the further west you go, you'll find more evidence of uh, petroglyphs, especially in the southwest. Yeah, where you have with, sandstones. Yeah, sandstones. Right. Say, yeah. yeah, so that's why you don't find a hell of a lot of petroglyphs. Yeah. Uh, there's a researcher to, uh, Yeah, there's, there's a researcher by the name of Edward Lennox who lives in right. northern New Jersey who has published numerous books on this subject. He's got a new one coming out, too. Uh, and I'd refer you to him. Uh, he's documented as many of them as can be documented for the Northeast. It, and so, it, it, you know, and when we uh, look at some of these, and uh, like you mentioned with the uh, you know, possible. Uh, Petroglyphs being uh, a Norse writing. Uh, what do you think of uh, a, a you know, controversial New England structure like the Newport Tower? Could, could that be Norse or? Well, all of the archaeology that has been done around the Newport Tower, and there's been quite a lot of it. There have been numerous expeditions. They have found cultural material there dating to the 18th century and no older. And we know that Benedict Arnold was somehow or other involved in that area. So I'm willing to consider the possibility that that thing is something built during the colonial era. I'm not convinced that it's anything else but I'm willing to look at evidence but so far the evidence that I've seen looks like it's all pretty much 18th century and newer okay well, well, uh, uh, go ahead Steve uh, well um, during the last uh, couple of years uh, researcher friend Pat Shekelton and I 
we've been working together on trying to solve this mystery of the Newport Tower. And we made some very interesting discoveries over the last two years, mainly in the area of maps. And I sent you some information. Uh, Mm -hmm. We found uh, three maps. One is called the Balesco map, dated 1610. Uh, That was uh, drawn by John Daniel. And on it, it's a very detailed map. A lot of people thought it was a forgery because it was so detailed for that time period. But if you look at where Narragansett Bay is, now it's mislabeled. It has like the Elizabethan Islands. But if you look at the map, and the way it's uh, set up, uh, you can see where the gentleman put the Elizabethan Islands in the wrong area. And the island that appears to be a Quidnick Island has a red dot in the area where Newport or settlement would have been. But most people, would, but then you would say, well, that really doesn't prove anything. But what it does prove is that John Daniel in 1610 saw something. He didn't say what it was on Aquidneck Island on the Valesco map. Then we located the map 1631 by Jean, J-E-A-N, Gourard, G-U-E-R-A-R-D, 1631. It's an original map. The same with the Valesco map is an original map. And there we see where Narragansett Bay is. We see a black rec- a black rectangle jutting out from where Aquidneck Island is located. Now, it's not an island portrayed on the map. It's part of the mainland. Uh, but it is a, uh, an object, very uh, distinguished, very noticeable, and would be in the same area of where the tower would be located. Then there's a map from 1639, again, drawn by John Daniel. It has a protrusion coming out of what appears to be a Quidnick Island, rectangular in shape with an X through it, signifying what looks to be a possible windmill. But what you have to understand is that Newport was not settled until until May 1st, 1639. So this item was already there in 1639, Mm. 1631, and possibly 1610. Now, we've we've actually gotten the the original uh, map from the museum in Florence, and we're having it analyzed now, but you can actually see, again, the protrusion on the original map uh, from that particular time. Well, you know, when we had uh, Bill Mann as the guest, uh, you know, one of his, you know, the book we were uh, reviewing had you know, a co- copy of uh, one of the maps from uh, the the uh, like Sinclair voyage or is uh, you know one of those like very Cabot uh, maps. It, it was you know very early uh, uh, North American history uh, 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 maps, and you know th- there were some. Uh, European type castle looking structures on a few locations along like uh, you know, Nova Scotia and like east the uh, eastern seaboard of Canada. Um, I, you know, it, 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 it's a you know, very intriguing concept i i I just um i've never seen it um i don't you know i I, it's just nice to get get some uh 
diverse opinions on this possibility. I, you, know, you hear you know, people talking about the you know, eight pillars that uh, you know, this windmill uh, or possible windmill are, are standing on. It, you know, it seems like it's Templar related. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm just th- throwing out the questions. Yep. I, I just no. I, I, I don't know what to think of it either, but you know, there you know, we there is a precedence for other European uh structures being here prior to the traditional founding of North America. Uh, well that it's probably I mean, not the Norse because the Norse really were not interested in settling so much as they you know they had their one settlement on Newfoundland Island mm-hmm. and um they got caught in an environmental uh problem in that the uh temperatures went down for a period of time and uh the colonies in Greenland upon which they depended um were forced to close down and so that was their line of supply so they had to abandon the uh, the Newfoundland Lonsel Meadow colony, uh, whether that is the same as the Vinland that's mentioned in the sagas, nobody knows. Probably, um, but further south, as much as I can see, they merely explored rather than settling. As for Sinclair, uh, you may be aware that there is um, claim of there being a um a structure or a uh, a tomb in the town of Westford, Massachusetts, which is supposedly associated with him. Uh it has been determined pretty conclusively that that thing is a punched carving made by kids in the late 19th century as a kind of a school or after school project. So that one is not what it was thought to be by Frank Lynn. Uh, 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 that's the Westford Knight you're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that one turns out not to be genuine. So you now, have to be, uh, you know, you have to be very careful to examine all of the evidence for these things before jumping to conclusions. I, you know, I certainly agree with, uh, with Curtis that, uh, a lot of the uh, archaeological digs at the Newport Tower have turned up nothing prior to the 17th century. I certainly agree with that. There's been some testing of the of the uh, mortar uh, that actually had a date from 1400 to 1800. Uh, but that's a pretty the- wide range. Yeah, but yeah, it is a pretty wide range. Most, but most of it was, you know, sixteen, seventy. But there was that one outlier of fourteen hundred. But we also have evidence that was recently found in a book written by John Jocelyn. Uh, he wrote the book in sixteen seventy four, but he was in America in sixteen thirty eight, and then in sixteen sixty eight. And he writes, he says, "quote The next place." of note on the main is Narragansett Bay. Within the bay is Rhode Island, which was today is as Aquidneck Island, a harbor for the Shunamishish brethren and St. Errant, the Quakers, who are rather to be esteemed vagabonds than religious persons. <laughs> oh, boy. What do you so what he's saying is that in that in on Rhode Island, on Aquinnick Island, on the harbor, there was a sect of wandering Quakers already there on Aquinnick Island. Now this is he's writing in 1638. He says at the further end of the bay, by the mouth of the Narragansett River, on the south side thereof was Old Plymouth. Plantation, year 1602. On the on the William Woods map of 1634, Patrick Shackleton 
my fellow researcher, showed on a map that the latitude of Old Plymouth, where it is marked on the William Woods map, corresponds to the exact location of where Newport is today. Mm. Now, then he says, 20 miles out to sea, south of Rhode Island, lies Martha's Vineyard on, in the way to Virginia. Then it says, King James, his reign, it was divided into providences, as is before named. In 1602, these north parts were further discovered by Captain Bartholomew Gosnold. The first English that planted there set down not far from Narragansett Bay and called their colony Plymouth, since Old Plymouth, in the year 1602. Hmm. So we have some written evidence as well as a couple of maps that kind of give the indication that there was someone on Aquidneck Island, Quakers, as early as 1602. So there was some kind of settlement, plantation, where Newport is now, a couple of uh, protrusions on maps that look like could be the Newport Tower. I'm not saying it's definitive, but at least uh, there seems to be the possibility that the Newport Tower was already there before the colonists came. And Well, that's, that's tantalizing. Uh, it is. I I would want to have a much closer look at Jocelyn's account. Absolutely. Um, yeah, because he may have his facts a little bit mixed up. It's possible. Well, uh, one thing in Jocelyn's favor, and uh, he was an astute observer mm-hmm. of of uh, just about everything, because he wrote a couple of books on the flora and fauna and uh, bird population uh, went into great detail and specifics. So Mm -hmm. I would think uh, that uh, his rendition of what he saw in Narragansett Bay uh, is probably as accurate, you know, as he would have uh, done the rest of the rest of his work. Uh, Now, Jocelyn has been published for a long time. Why do you suppose no one's picked up on this before? Don't know. Well, I, I went yeah. right back to the I went right back to the original, to the original uh, yeah. the old old English. Uh, sure, but as I said, you know his his work has been out there for a long time. So I would have thought that someone would have taken an interest in that and and uh, well, uh, try to explore they, it. Well, they would have taken the old English and translated it uh, the way that they believed that he probably meant it. Yeah. They would have have taken that 17th century mindset and information and interpreted it with their 21st century mindset. So what else can we do? Just, uh, just read it for what it says, I guess. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it is interesting that these structures are appearing on uh, some of these old maps. And, you know, I just, um, it, you know, we, we can talk about it some other time. It, you know, we're down to, you know, I don't know, f- five, six minutes left. It, it, um, you know, it, what are some things that you would like to ascertain about the cairns or whatever that you think that would help you to have that one moment of clarity where everything comes together and you have a much better understanding of um, yeah. You know, well, uh, this aspect of America's uh, post-contact or you know late prehistory. Well, I, one thing that I like to 
to say about this is that it's my conviction that we are at the very beginnings of the science of these structures. Mm-hmm. There is so much more to be learned for from them. Yeah, I think you're right. And and, and what and, I would say is, is that um, I will continue to the best of my ability to dedicate my the rest of my life trying to improve upon research techniques, um, whether it be from picture taking to measurements, uh, to commentary, to GPS points, and making sure that Dr. Hoffman, the Gages, James and Mary Gage, the tribes get the very best information because I'm the one who is looking at all of this material in person. I just want to be able to convey that information as accurately as possible to those people who will honor that information, take that information, and make something meaningful out of it. That's that's my only desire and my only wish uh, with what I do. Okay. And, and we're down to uh, th- three minutes now. Uh and Dr. Hoffman, do you, do you want to tell people where they could find a copy of Stone Prayers? Well, first of all, it is available on Amazon.com and on the various other um, e-tailers that sell books. Uh, I am going around giving a number of uh, talks on the book. Uh, the next one is scheduled for June 13th in the town of Ashland, Massachusetts. And I will be doing others uh, in the summer and in the fall that we're we're still trying to organize and get dates for. Um, But as I said, you can certainly get it through um, the e-tail, email, um, online places. Okay. And also, if people have knowledge of sites that they would be willing to share with me, uh, I will give you my email address, and you can get me the information because I am still adding to the inventory. So you can reach me at C, then the numeral one, Hoffman, H O F F M A N, at bridge b r i d g e w dot e d u, and I will be able to get that from. Uh, that's my college email address. Okay. That um, there, or way if people have a uh, made a discovery, they can email you and mm-hmm. send you a photo. Uh, yeah, basically, out. what I need is a location with either GPS or a street address or some description that I can find it on a map, uh, mm-hmm. and how many structures are there and of what types, and then that will be helpful for adding to the inventory. Because I am, you know, I am adding to the inventory all the time. I have more than 500 sites since the uh, book was went to press. Uh, and uh, Mark, and Mark, I, I would I would like to uh, uh, say that uh, James and Mary Gage's work. You can you can go to their website, which is www.stonestructures.org. And their book, Land of a Thousand Carns, Land of a Thousand Carns, uh, get more than likely be found on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, or uh, or even probably at their website, which is stonestructures.org. org. Okay. Hey, uh, that we are almost out of time. Thank you, Barbara, for producing this, and th- thank.